The Soybean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Pride Seeds, Aragon LQ Pre-Harvest Weed Control, and Cruiser Max Vibrance Beans. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Soybean School. Uh, today we're going to talk uh, about soil fertility, specifically phosphorus and potassium. And what's the right level, soil test level, of P and K? What happens when you have too much or too little? And, uh, you know, how does it impact soybean yield? Um, to tackle these questions, I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Laura Lindsay from Ohio State University. Laura, how's it going? Thanks for stopping by, joining us on uh, Soybean School. Yeah, it's good to be here. Hey, um, Laura, you recently um, shared some of your fertility research uh, during a presentation at the Ontario Agricultural Conference. Um, I, I want to jump into that. Um, when it comes to feeding the soybean plant, uh, what soil test levels are, are we targeting for phosphorus? So in Ohio, uh, for phosphorus, we're looking at uh, 20 to 40 parts per million based on a Malik 3 extraction. And so that's our guidelines for Ohio. We share those with Indiana and Michigan uh, as part of our tri-state soil fertility guidelines. Um, so that's what we use. But in Canada, other states, there would, could be different extractions, uh, different different maintenance levels. But 20 to 40 parts per million is uh, where you should be at to maintain uh, your soil test P. Hmm. Now, you uh, you shared some great data from your Ohio, Ohio State trials. And um, let's take a look at that. The first question um, for you is, what happens when P uh, falls below those target levels? So if soil test P falls below 20 parts per million, uh, it could be limiting yield. And the lower you get, the more likely you are are to be uh, limiting yield. In our research in Ohio, um, we were able to overlay yield maps to different areas of field where we tested soil test phosphorus. And when we fell below that 20 parts per million, we saw about a 7 bushel per acre yield difference in soybean compared to areas that had uh, at least 20 parts per million. Wow, seven bushels. I mean, that's pretty significant, Laura. Um, let's switch to potassium. Uh, what's the critical soil test level for K, and what happens when you fall below that target? So the soil test level, critical level we call it, um, the critical soil test level for potassium can be variable depending on your soil's cation exchange capacity. So in our um, old version of the tri-states, I think there was four different levels uh, based if you were a CEC of 5, 10, 15, or 20. Um, I think that's changed recently. We've recently revised that. I think there's only maybe two levels now to consider. So uh, when you look at soil test K, you also have to look at what's that in relationship to your cation exchange capacity. So with our, our data, um, we looked at soil test K critical levels, but in relation to that soil CEC, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. What about results? Um, how does a, how how does a how do the results um, from a yield perspective compare to uh, phosphorus? So for a soil test K, again, we compared areas of the field that were below that critical level versus above the critical level, and, and when the soil was below the critical level, um, there was about a four bushel yield reduction uh, compared to above the critical level. So. Again, uh, there was some yield losses associated there with those low, low soil test K soils. So we've talked about, you know, what happens when we hit that maintenance range um, for P and K. Uh, what happens when we exceed those levels? Is more better? So in our research, no. Um, we have these, these guidelines, these maintenance range where we want to um, apply fertilizer to compensate for what you remove when you're harvesting. So the P and K coming out of the grains, so that's our maintenance level. When we exceed that maintenance level um, and add more, more fertilizer on anyways, uh, we've seen uh, a very little benefit there. So similar to uh, with our, our um, looking at low soil test K, and pea soils, we also compared that maintenance range versus above the maintenance range, and there was no significant differences there in terms of yield. So when it comes to managing soil fertility, we hear a lot about the sufficiency approach versus build and maintain. What does your research say about, I guess, maybe the best approach? 
you know, I think that depends on the farmer. Um, building takes time and it takes inputs. And um, if you're a landowner and it's your field, you know, building and maintaining may make a lot of sense. Um, if you're renting a field and you may only have it for a year or two, um, just applying what the, the, the plant needs that year may be a better approach. So I think both are, are adequate and I think it just depends on the, the particular field scenario, who owns it and what, what strategy that farmer wants to use. Mm. Um, final question for you, and you know, f- you know, from your perspective, um, when you look at your trial data, you know, what's the message for growers here? You know, who are really always trying to fine tune their management and, and drive yield. I think it's knowing what the limitation is on your field. You know, we did all this soil testing uh, at 199 different fields across Ohio. Sometimes P was low and K was fine. Sometimes K was low and P was fine. Sometimes drainage was really bad. Sometimes there was resistant weeds. Sometimes there were soybean cyst nematodes. So I always like to encourage farmers to get out in their field, you know, walk around, take soil samples, look for soybean cyst nematode, look at your nutrients. You can pull tissue samples, you know, or do you have a macronutri- micronutrient deficiency? So really knowing your field, um, there's a lot of variability, knowing your field and what the particular problem is in, in your situation. Hey, Laura, that's great stuff. Uh, really appreciate you joining us on the Soybean School. It's been fun. Uh, hopefully you'll come back and do it again. Yes, absolutely. I appreciate it. 